I'm going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bibles or your Bible app and turn to uh, Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2 is our text. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's perfectly fine. If you're at our Sweetwater campus, grab one of the Bibles in the seats in, around you and turn to page 1018. If you're joining us in our Parker campus, then uh, run back to the table right behind you, right there in the middle. Grab one of those Bibles and turn to page 1018. You'll be able to follow along with us. And, uh, and as always, if you are at one of our campuses and you don't have a Bible and you want one, take one of those with you. We actually mean it. It's not stealing. It's a gift. We want you to have God's Word and read God's Word. If you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, then please, by all means, uh, just make a request. We'll get you a Bible. We want everyone to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know if you read and apply God's Word, then God will change your life. Now, uh, I do have to, to brag just for a moment on uh, Jared because he said it's an original song. He didn't tell you that he wrote it and, uh, and is releasing it. He and Chase are releasing it this week. So, um, so look for it and download it. And uh, if you like Christmas music, then download it. If you don't like Christmas music, download it and give it to somebody. Uh, but... Uh, you know, give us a gift. Uh, but it's, uh, it's just kind of fun. When, uh, and if you don't like Christmas music, well, then get over it. It's the season. Uh, so, hey, uh, speaking of Christmas, uh, you know, we got Christmas Eve services in uh, two weeks, and we would love for you to be a part of those. Uh, and, and Pete mentioned the times and, and all that. I'm going to remind you that we'd love for you to come and celebrate the birth of Jesus with us. We're going to have uh, Christmas Eve services, uh, four in Havasu, one in Parker, and, and uh, nothing on Christmas Day live. All of our services will be streamed at their normal times uh, on that day, but we're going to replay the Christmas Eve services. So you can, uh, if you loved it, you can watch it again. If you missed it, you can watch it. But that's what's going to happen on that weekend of Christmas, and I just got to say this because I, I really want to see it happen. I, if you are a follower of Jesus and you've never been baptized, um, sign up to get baptized Christmas Eve. We've already got a number of people who are doing that. We would love for you to testify to all the people who fill the, the campuses that Jesus Christ is Lord and he's transformed your life, and I can't think of a better way to say, Jesus, I'm committed to following you 100% than on the day we celebrate his birthday, you say, I'm his. And he's changed my life. So uh, grab one of the Connect cards, sign up, uh, let us know, call the office, sign up. We, we'd be just glad to help you be obedient to Jesus. If you're joining us online and you want to just like show up and get back, we're fine with that too. Uh, just let us know. We'll make it happen. Hey, uh, Christmas is two weeks away. You guys ready? Yeah. Uh, kind of a mixed crowd there. Uh, I haven't bought my one present yet, so uh, I'm not ready. But... Uh, Hey, do you guys, are you guys excited about Christmas? Yeah. Okay, some are. Some are like, hey, it's coming anyway. I might as well show up. Uh, so here's, here's the thing. What is it about Christmas that you really enjoy? So don't tell me, but the person next to you, I want you to just go ahead and tell them for like the next 15 seconds. You guys take turns. What is your favorite single thing about Christmas? Ready, set, go. Okay, let's, let's confess here just for a moment, all right? So, so who said their favorite thing was, was the decorations and all that kind of stuff? Lights and, and, and all that? You love driving around, seeing the houses? There's a few decorations, people. Uh, what about uh, just the fact you get to be with family? Is that, is that oh, a lot of family? You, you guys all said that because you know you have to. Uh, Okay, who, who was honest and said it's about the gifts, whether you're giving them or, or getting them? Who, who said gifts? Yeah, okay. Lots of people, you know, the gifts, it, it's, it, if you have kids and grandkids at home, then that's a, a blast. Okay, who said the music? Who said the Christmas music was their favorite? Just, just, just a few, okay. Hey, Jared, there's going to be like four people who download your stuff. Uh, <laughs> all right, what about the food? Who said food? <laughs> of course. What, what about uh, just all the parties and celebrations that you get to go to? Does anyone, anyone say that one? Okay, we've got one, two. I see those hands. Uh -huh, yeah, all right. Hey, no matter what you enjoy. Oh, wait, I didn't ask. Any, any Grinches in the room? Oh, there's a few. Thank you for those confessions. Or despise about Christmas because Grinches are real. Uh, 
Christmas is really and ultimately a celebration of the birth of Jesus. Okay, that, that's what Christmas is about. And, and if we lose sight of this reality because of all of the things going on, all the busyness and all the decorations and all the parties and all the shopping and all the, the, the eating, then I'm just going to tell you, it diminishes the power of Christmas. Now, none of that stuff is bad. All that, you know, all the gatherings and all the things that we do, that, you know, that, that's fine. But if we let them distract us from just focusing on and remembering that it's about Jesus, about his birth, then we're the ones who are losing the power of Christmas. So what I want to do today is revisit a very familiar story and rediscover the amazing truths about the birth of Jesus. Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, Luke writes, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. And he went there to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. How many of you have heard that story before? <laughs> yeah, I would, I would hope so. If you haven't, then uh, this is what Christmas is all about. I, want, I just want to start by telling you that Christmas uh, is, is really about the reality that Jesus is a historical Savior. Jesus is a historical Savior. In other words, Jesus is a real person. He is not a myth. He's not a fantasy. He's not an idea. But he was born in Bethlehem, in a place. Now, it's a different time, different place, different culture than where, where we live. But he was born in the exact same way that most of the moms in this room gave birth. Okay, if you had a C-section, you're, you're excluded. Uh, but... Uh, but, but did you notice the details, the historical details in Luke's account of Jesus' birth? First of all, he mentions Caesar Augustus, who was the emperor at the time. Not the time that Luke wrote this, but at the time that Jesus was born. And all history recognizes Caesar Augustus. Uh, you know, he's not uh, made up in any way, shape, or form. He was a Roman emperor from 31 B.C. to 14 A.D. And he talks about uh, the census or the registration that was taken and, and this was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And it's important to know that because uh, Augustus liked to know how many people he could tax in Rome. Uh, and, uh, and so he ordered multiple census taken. The first one he ordered was in 29 B.C. They counted 4,063,000 citizens or people in Roman Empire. And then they ordered one in 8 B.C., 4.2 million people. And in 14 A.D., 4.9 million people. So he was, he was sending these out for these taxes, for these purposes, and so we know he ordered them. And you're like going, well, uh, 8 B.C., isn't that a little bit before Jesus was born? Well, first of all, the exact year that Jesus was born is often debated, and it's not zero or one or anything like that. Uh, most historians believe he was born somewhere between 4 and 8 B.C. And secondly, uh, a census back then, a registration, a tax— People had to travel. You couldn't just like mail in stuff or come here. You know, it, it takes us with all of our technology a year to count people, right? A year. So imagine in that day and time, uh, a census was you know not something that happened uh, on a on a simple basis. But um, but it's, it's details. He's he's telling you when this happened. He's recording this. And this guy, Quirinius, governor, of, and I don't know if that's how you say his name or not. That's just how I'm saying it. You guys can say it however you want. Uh, he, we know that he was a military governor, the general commanding Syria from 12 to 2 B.C. And then he was a peacetime governor later on, starting in 6 A.D. And so people were debating about when he was governor. And, and the skeptics were like, well, but he wasn't governor at the right time. Uh, look, but he was there at the time that a census was taken. Um, and... And he would have been there at the time the second one was taken. So this is historical. Jesus is a historical Savior. And then there's 
extra documents that tell us about Jesus, the life and death of Jesus, from secular historians. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but there was this guy named Josephus Flavius who was a Jewish historian in the first century. He's actually born after the time of Christ, uh, lived to the uh, uh, late first century. He mentions Jesus twice. Now, again, some of the people who, who uh, don't believe in Jesus want to argue, well, but, you know, uh, Josephus, there was edits and stuff like that, and it's been spruced up. But well, they found an older manuscript that had Josephus' writings that were unedited or unenhanced by uh, Christians. And so this is what he said in one of his recordings. He said, at that time, there was a wise man called Jesus, and his conduct was good, and he was known to be virtuous. Many people among the Jews and other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die. But those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he had appeared to them three days after the crucifixion and that he was alive. Accordingly, he was perhaps the Messiah concerning whom the prophets have reported wonders. And the tribe of Christians so named after him has not disappeared to this day. There's other historical records that affirm the life and death of Jesus. Pliny the Younger, who's the governor of Bithynia, writes to Trajan the emperor about these Christians and what to do with them. And he goes into some of the historical details about it. That was in the second century A.D. In other words, I just want you to know Jesus is not some kind of mythical, imaginary idea. He's flesh and blood. Born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, died in Jerusalem. So... If you are a, somebody who's a little bit skeptical about the claims of Christ, if you're somebody who's like, well, but Christianity is just a made-up religion and all these people, I, I want you to understand, no, it's based in history. There was this guy who lived and died in the first century whose name was Jesus from Nazareth. Our faith is based in fact. I, I just want you to hear this. Our faith is based in fact. Jesus was a man who lived in the first century, Judea and Galilee, who was executed by Rome. Now, here's the, here's the part that makes this uh, significant. His disciples claim that Jesus was raised from the dead and is God in the flesh. And they were willing to suffer and die horrible deaths for that belief. Okay, they, they for, for a lifetime, for decades, they lived out that reality. They began, continued to proclaim that reality that Jesus was raised from the dead, that he was alive, that he ascended to heaven, and they were willing to suffer horrible treatment, mistreatment, uh, imprisonment, beatings, executions without ever denying that reality. I love what Chuck Colson said, you know, the guy who was part of Watergate who met Jesus in prison and started prison fellowship. He said, I know that Jesus uh, was raised from the dead because Watergate convinced me. He said, uh, you know, you had 12 guys who, who stood to gain nothing from suffering and, and torture and imprisonment and never broke, never recanted in, in 40 plus years. He goes, 12 of the most powerful men in the world couldn't keep a secret for two weeks with Watergate. He goes, I know the resurrection happened. It's real. So here's the thing. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you actually believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins and was raised from the dead, and you've made a commitment to follow Jesus, your faith is based in reality. Your faith is based in historical fact, and, and it's not based in traditions. It's not based in beliefs. It's not based in practices. It is based in the reality that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Okay, that the resurrection is real. And you have experienced a life-changing re relationship with Jesus who is alive today. Okay, that's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And if you're sitting here and you're not yet a follower of Jesus and you're thinking, I don't know about this, it sounds a little bit crazy, but on the other hand, there's all these documents and history and, and I see these people. Look, we want you to become a follower of Jesus too. We want you to trust our Savior. Um, so if you haven't experienced this life-changing relationship with Jesus, we'd love to talk about it. See one of the pastors after the service. We'd love to have that conversation. Our prayer team's gonna be here at the front. They would love to pray with you, talk with you. If you don't wanna do those, at least fill out a Connect card and say, somebody call me and let's talk about Jesus. We would love to do that. So Christmas is about our historical Savior, Jesus. And Christmas means... Jesus is God with us. Now, I want to cheat and flip over to the Gospel of Matthew, page uh, 
959 if you want to get to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew and Luke are the two gospel writers that talk about the birth of Jesus. And Luke talks about it from Mary's perspective and what she's going through. Matthew talks about it from Joseph's perspective. And, and Matthew, uh, or excuse me, Joseph was not going to uh, marry Mary. Mary, Mary. That's, he was not going to keep the engagement going. How's that? He was going to break it off uh, when he found out she was pregnant because he knew he wasn't the dad. Pretty, pretty big deal. And this is what... Matthew writes about the birth of Jesus. Uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, he says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way when his mother Mary had been betrothed, engaged, but a little bit more serious, to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Uh, He's echoing what Luke chapter 1 tells us about Mary. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit, and she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he took his wife but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Jesus is God with us. No other religion tells the story of God with us. I mean, there are plenty of religions that have stories of gods among us, But usually those gods among us are creating havoc and destroying things or conquering things. They're always superheroes, sort of like, you know, Marvel would create. Uh, But Jesus means God came to be with us. He came to be one of us. I, I mean, think about it. Jesus was born in poverty. He was born in obscurity. He was born under questionable social circumstances. And and Jesus did not demonstrate, uh, publicly anyway, a remarkable life until he turned 30. He was just a nobody living in a backwater town called Nazareth, which one of his apostles, when he first met Jesus or even before that, he said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And then when Jesus started his ministry, his family and his community, Nazareth, were dismissive towards him. They didn't believe in him at first. You see, Jesus came to conquer death, not nations. Jesus was a king without any of the trappings of royalty, and Jesus was like you and I in every way except without sin. Jesus is God with us. What does that mean, God with us? It means that God is present. He is present with you right now. Wherever you are, Uh, Hebrews 13, the writer says that that God promises, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. If you've confessed Jesus as Lord, then God the Holy Spirit resides inside of you. He is always with you, and he will never abandon you. He will take you all the way to heaven. That's his promise. Now, there may be times that you don't feel like God is with you, but he has promised to be with you always. 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 Uh, anyone in here like me, uh, you, when you were growing up, uh, you felt like an outcast. You were kind of the, one of the people unwanted. I was always the new kid. Anybody, anyone want to just go, hey, I wasn't uh, the popular one? Okay. See, God with us, God being present with you means that you're never alone. You're never forsaken. You're never forgotten. You matter to God Almighty. That's good news. So God with us means that God is present, and it means that God is aware. God is aware. He knows your hurts. He knows your battles. He knows your failures. He knows your betrayals and struggles. Look, Jesus said in Matthew 6, when he's teaching on prayer, he said, your father knows what you need before you ask. But he still wants you to talk to him. He wants to have a conversation about those hurts, about the struggles, about the pain. He wants to hear about your hopes and your dreams, even the ones that are broken. And he still wants to talk with us so he can forgive our evil thoughts and desires and actions and lead us to truth and life. There is nothing in your life that is hidden from God 
and he still loves you. Let that sink in for a minute. There is nothing in your life that is hidden from God, and yet he still loves you. Does that not freak anybody out just a little bit? There's nothing in your life that is hidden from God. In other words, God knows what you want, even when you don't pursue it. God knows your, your, your most evil thoughts, even when you don't speak them or act on them. Look, I don't know about you, but I know about me, and that's, that, that's, that's bad news. That is bad news. And, and yet the King of kings and Lord of lords who knows how evil I am, yet he is, he is aware of all that, and yet he cares for me. I'm not forgotten. You know that the, the psalmist says that God thinks about you more than there are grains on the, sand, on the seashore? Grains of sand on the seashore? Is that crazy? You're not an afterthought. You're not unimportant. You're not insignificant. God values you, and he's aware of you and your situation and your struggles. So God with us means that God is present. God is aware, and, and it means that God is for us. I love what Romans 8, 31 says. The Apostle Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? It's kind of a rhetorical question. It means nobody. It doesn't matter who's against you because God is for you. And if God is for you, then, then you win. You win. The King of kings, creator of the universe, the one who defeated sin, death, and hell, who holds all authority is for you. See, you know, we're talking about rejoicing. This is reason to rejoice. This is a reason because Jesus is your advocate. The Holy Spirit is your helper. God is our loving Father who wants you to succeed. And you know that because he tells you he's with us. See, if we get this, it ought to change our attitude about everything, about life. Um, Sort of like, and, and I don't know if this surprises you or if this like just kind of bounces off your heart and doesn't sink in, but this, this ought to be one of those life-changing moments when you realize that God is for you. So I was about 11 years old. I was living in this little town in central Illinois called Rochester, and I was uh, walking home with my little brother who was six. So he was first grade, I was sixth grade, and we're walking home from school, and uh, these kids started harassing us. And they were older than me. I don't know if they were junior high, young high school. And, and they kind of cornered us. My little brother's crying, and they're knocking the books out of hands and, and all this kind of stuff. And I thought, oh, so I'm about to get beat up. And uh, I guess I'm going to have to, like, you know, go crazy on these guys, you know, berserker kind of thing, because they're going to mess with my little brother. And suddenly, there is a truck that's coming down the street too fast, and it suddenly goes sideways, locked up in its brakes. And my brother and some of his friends jump out. Now, my oldest brother, he was 16 at the time, uh, my oldest brother never talked to me. I mean, we, we had words, but they were never conversation. Can we, can we just go with that? I grew up living in fear for my life from my oldest brother. I mean, he tormented me. He tortured me. He abused me. And I, I really thought every day, am I going to die today because this guy uh, wants me gone? Okay, that, that was my relationship with my oldest brother. We honestly did not have a civil conversation until I was at least 16 years old. And, uh, and so he jumps out of the truck, and I think, oh, great, now there's gonna, he's going to pile on, and I get beat up by even more guys. <laughs> but instead, he and his buddies just go over, and they grab these kids, and they threaten their lives if they ever touch us again, and they throw them down. And then without saying a word to me, he gets back in the truck and drives off. <laughs> and I, can I just tell you, I had weird emotions at that moment. Because <laughs> I'm like, wait, you can abuse me, but nobody else can. But you know what I realized in that moment? That made me smile a little bit on the inside and, and begin to question if I, uh, the thoughts that I had that my brother was pure evil. Uh, I realized that he was for me. That if I was in trouble, that this guy who never, never treated me with kindness or respect was still for me. And, and I was kind of like, oh, what do you know? That's not a bad thing to know. And, and we're good friends now, uh, and, and all that. And, but he's still for me, and, and that's a good thing to know. Now, here's, I, I tell that story, not just so you laugh and know about my, my background, but here's the thing. God is for you. 
He is for you. He, he, he wants you to thrive. He wants you to succeed. He wants you to have life. He wants you to have joy. And that's why he's done all this stuff. Look, God is for you. That's why you can trust his word, his wisdom, his counsel. That's why we want you to read and apply God's word because it really will change your life. God is for you. That's why you can be filled with joyful hope no matter what your circumstances are right now because in the end, you win. You see, God is for you. And that means that heaven is our destiny because of Jesus' birth. So Christmas, look, we, we celebrate a historical Savior. God is with us. And then here's the other thing. Christmas means Jesus saves us from our sins. Did you catch this? Verse 21, Matthew 1. The angel tells Joseph, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. This is what your son is going to do. Jesus came to rescue us from hell. Jesus came to rescue you from hell. This is personal. Yes, he wants to rescue us. He wants to save men and women, but he also came to rescue you. Personal. Change your life. John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Apostle said, If we walk in the light as Jesus is in the light, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus. His Son purifies us of all our sin. The Apostle Peter said, For you know it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you by your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Jesus came to rescue us from hell. Jesus came to rescue you from hell. The Christmas story is the salvation story, part one. It's the beginning of it. It's the birth of our Savior. Yes, God became flesh to give us an example. Yes, God became flesh to teach us and heal us and encourage us. But ultimately, Jesus came into this world to pay the penalty of our sin and rescue us from an eternity in hell. That's what he came to do for you and for me. Because we couldn't save ourselves, we couldn't rescue ourselves, nobody else was gonna do it. We need a savior. So God sent a savior, and his name was Jesus. His name is Jesus. And, and here's the thing, I want you to, to know the savior Jesus. I want you to believe that he died for your sins and was raised from the dead. I pray today that you'll follow Jesus as Lord. But here's the thing. If you're a follower of Jesus in here right now, you're probably saying, amen. You know, hey, I, I get it. Jesus is the Savior. So uh, I hope you take, have two takeaways with that. Honestly, I, I hope you walk out of here or turn off the TV when you're done watching and you have two takeaways. The first one is that you really can rejoice at the good news. I really do want you, we want you to rejoice. Put a smile on your face, have a bounce in your step, treat people differently because of the good news that you win, all that, okay? Secondly, look, friends don't go to heaven alone. You know, you don't wanna to go to heaven alone. Gather, look, we give you invite cards. Why? So you can invite people to come Christmas Eve. Why? Because people will say yes more likely to come Christmas Eve. Or, you know, if they turn you down for Christmas Eve, drag them here next week. We'll preach the gospel then too. Okay? It's, it's this simple. This is the easiest time of year to invite people to church and them not be offended. So don't just walk out thinking, I should invite someone and never do it. Go grab some connect, or connect cards, the, the handout cards, and go and invite some friends to come with you. And, and don't just go, here, hope you come. Okay, that's a nice thing to do. Give them to the strangers that you don't know and, and invite them, and that's nice. But go to your friends or your family and say, let's go together. Come with me. Bribe them. Come to one of the earlier services and take them to dinner afterwards, or take them to dinner and then come to the service. You know somebody who doesn't have any family or friends uh, around them, you're thinking they might be alone, say, hey, come do Christmas Eve with us. 
This is an opportunity for us to live out the belief that God sent a Savior and His name is Jesus. And, and if you don't really want to invite anybody, then you've got to ask yourself why. Now, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, we want you to follow Jesus. That, I mean, that's why we do this. That's why we talk about this. That's why we sing. That's why we preach. That's why we pray. Uh, we want you to become a follower of the Savior who gave his life for you. And if you're interested in doing that, again, come see me or one of the other pastors. Uh, come see the prayer team. Fill out a Connect card. But all you really have to do is say, Jesus, I surrender. I, I claim you as my Lord and Savior. We already told you all the rest. Believe that he died on the cross for your sins, was raised from the dead, and Scripture says you'll be saved. You will be saved. That, that's how this works. You guys, it's too easy. Yeah, it is. It's way too easy. You know, we should have to do something harder, but we don't. Because it's hard enough just to trust in the Savior that he's going to save you. Um, Christmas is real. You're, it's going to come in two weeks, whether you're ready or not. Whether you like it or not. Whether you've got plans or not. Uh, I want you to believe in the Savior who made it all happen because it's all about Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We, we just acknowledge that without you, we have no hope, no life, no peace, no way forward, no promise of heaven, and we are grateful that you chose to save us. We are grateful that, that you entered this world in weakness and in shame so that you could take our brokenness, our weakness, and our shame upon yourself. So God, just meet us here. We invite the Holy Spirit to just move in this room as we pause to remember your sacrifice for our sins. God, we want to be grateful, we want to rejoice, and we want to share the good news that Jesus is alive. It's in his name we pray. Amen.